So what's up, everybody? Good morning. My name is Simon Hill, Black American from Louisiana, coming to you live from Budapest, Hungary. It's about 11.02 a.m., April 14th, 2024, where I'm at right now. Now, last night, I did a live stream reacting to the Drake disc that dropped. Uh, pardon me, I just woke up, so I forgot the name of it already. It was dropping Give Me 50, yeah. And uh, after that, I went to sleep, uh, laid up with my big booty wife, had a very nice dinner with her, chatted, talked, uh, you know, did my manly duties, my husband duties. And then I went to sleep, woke up this morning, checked YouTube like I always do. First, I check my analytics. Then I check the, the feed and see what's popping. And what what do you know? The Drake uh, Civil War, the, 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 the Battle of the Avengers, all the hip hop megastars piling on Drake continues. And I am very excited to see this happening because I do believe it is good for hip hop to have these competitions, uh, to have these lyrical battles, to have these lyrical bouts and wars and stuff like that. I think it breathes excitement into the genre. It's what makes hip hop unique. You know that I love hip hop. If you don't know me, if you, this is your first time watching, I'm a writer for another YouTube channel called Cultureless Theory, where we rank hip hop and R&B albums from worst to first in a in an artist catalog. So I've written for Plies. I've written for um, uh, I've written for uh, uh, Joe, Joe Budden, uh, Talib Kweli. Uh, I got a video on Mystical. I got more videos dropping soon for like DJ Khaled, MF Doom, uh, E40. All of those are written. They're just in production right now. So. You know, I live, breathe hip hop. I'm a former rapper myself and I love the art form. I believe hip hop is the most important American genre of music that has ever been created. It's the most impactful and it's the one that has touched me the most. You know, certain lyrics I live by and uh, some of these artists I really admire as men. Uh, so yeah, this whole situation going on with Drake, I find highly fascinating. Uh, and I think it is one of the most interesting beefs that we've ever seen in hip hop. I don't think we've had a time where everybody just piles on and tries to attack the top dog, right? This is one of those moments in hip hop history that I think will stand out when we look back on it five or 10 years from now, because we didn't see everybody pile on Lil Wayne. We didn't see everybody pile on 50 Cent. We didn't see everybody pile on LL Cool J. We didn't see everybody pile on Snoop Dogg. Whoever was the top guy, they've always had competition. There's been one or two people who tried to uh, throw stones at the throne, but there's never been so so many people attacking them at one time. I guess the only comparison might be, you know, after Rockefeller fell apart and a lot of the guys in state property started dissing Jay-Z, like Oskino Sparks and stuff like that. Uh, Beanie Siegel even took a shot at Jay and stuff like that. But you get what I'm saying? Like, I find this ex extremely uh, strange extremely strange. And I wonder what's going on behind the scenes to make people jump out of the woodwork and attack Drake. And we're going to jump into this in this uh, live stream today. So I checked the feed this morning as soon as I woke up. And what do you know? Rick Ross has entered the chat. Oh, God, what is happening here? Now, now I start to understand a little bit why J. Cole wanted to drop out of this beef, because J. Cole probably saw that this was going to be massive. And J. Cole, if he did start it, if he attacked Kendrick, he would have to be on side of Drake as the rest of the industry goes to war with Drake, lyrically, right? And J. Cole would have to be battling Rick Ross, battling Future, battling The Weeknd, battling ASAP Rocky. It would have been insane. So I do think J. Cole and Drake, like, tag teaming against the industry would be insane and fun to watch and great to listen to and great for hip-hop. But we also have this other element of hip hop, which is the street element, which we cannot take away. So I imagine that, you know, Rick Ross is more of a gangster rapper, even though he was a CO, even though he is somewhat some people consider a fake gangster and stuff like that. He's surrounded by real gangsters. He's surrounded by real hitters, like all of the rappers, right? Everybody's got an entourage, a crew that's willing to fight and die over them, throw fists for them and stuff like that. But if Rick Ross is entering the chat and already Future and uh, Metro Boom, and they're more street orientated than Drake and J. Cole are, right? This could get really ugly and messy if this beef continues and it starts to escalate, depending on what people say. I Looking back on the live stream I did last night, I missed the lyrics in Drake's uh, Drop and Give Me 50, where he's taking shots at Kendrick Lamar's baby mother or wife, right? I missed the shots when he was talking about Whitney, 
right? I don't like that, how Drake always has to drop somebody's woman into a diss, like how he did against Pusha T, talking about Virginia. I let it ring on you like Virginia Williams, right, in the Duppy freestyle. Like, I don't like that about Drake because that makes it a bit messy, and it's harder to come back from that because after all of these disses, all of these uh, songs, we want the brothers to come together, make a one big record, one big joint album, do a concert, and make a ton of money, and everybody's happy and healthy, right? We don't want anybody to die. We don't want anybody hurt. That's what I'm trying to get at here. But but Drake seems to always try to push the limits, push the envelope, okay? So, like I'm saying, I woke up and I saw Rick Ross enter the chat. He dropped a song called Champagne Moments, and we're going to really break this down, all right? I'm listening to this for the first time live. If you're in the live stream chat, drop a comment on what you think about this whole fiasco, because we're going to really get into it here. So I'm going to play the song here on stream. Let y'all know what I think about it. And I have the lyrics on the screen, too. And we're going to read them, break them down. All right. So, uh, yeah, drop a like, share, comment, and let's get into it. I'm going to play this for the first time right here. I'm playing this for the first time right here, right now. All right. I don't know where Ross is going with this. Jesus Christ. Okay. I didn't, I walked into this with expectations that Ross is going to take a, a more street angle with this. Uh, I should have said my expectations before listening to the song. I didn't really know what to expect other than that Ross might be a bit more street with it, calling out Drake for, you know, being a suburban kid who grew up in Toronto, you know, uh, was on TV shows and stuff like that. None of that actually happened. That was my expectation for how it was coming up. I had no idea where the, the animosity came from. I heard about 
Rick Ross unfollowing Drake on Instagram and stuff like that. But I didn't know the reason why that actually happened. But now that he explained it, it's about a cease and desist to French Montana. But for what? I'm going to click the annotation right here and break this down. Let's read through this right here. So Rick Ross could be alluding to the song Big Pun featuring Drake that was rumored to be on French Montana's Mac and Cheese 5. A snippet of this song was leaked in May 2023 and then in full in December. It was believed that the song was produced by Metro Boomin. He may also be referring to Splash Brothers, another leak track with Montana and Drake, initially scheduled for Montana's album They Got Amnesia. The song was then finally released on Mac and Cheese 5 with Rick Ross and Lil Wayne replacing Drake. Very interesting. So Rick Ross is standing up for his homie French Montana, another big rapper who's from New York, but uh, fr frequently collaborates with uh, Rick Ross and also lives in Miami and stuff like that. <clears throat> so Rick Ross is like writing for his home team, right? But I didn't feel like this is warranted. I feel like there's probably something deeper too, because in this song, he's alluding to women. Once again, uh, a lot of these guys are beefing over women. He said, let me, let you DM my hoe. You got bitches you can't, but got bitches you can't, stuff like that. So I don't know. I think he's alluding to Drake hollering at his girls and stuff like that. And maybe that's an issue here. So following the, the release of Future and Metro Booming, We Don't Trust You, Rick Ross unfollowed Drake on Instagram. Rick Ross was featured on Everyday Hustle on We Don't Trust You and on the song Dissed His Baby Mama. Baby Mama still the biggest op. Four days after the release of We Don't Trust You, Drake invited Rick Ross's ex, Christina Mackey, to his concert. Okay, so yeah, that's Petty Drake. Um, I don't know where that came from. Like, why would you? Okay, that, you know, Rick Ross is having a beef with his baby mother, and then you invite his baby mother to the concert. That seems like a provocation. And Rick Ross and Drake used to have a very close relationship. They used to make songs together. Used to, I think they did a whole EP together, or they were rumored to do a whole EP together. They were on Stay Scheming together, which was a big song. Uh, that's the one where Drake said, uh, you wasn't with me shooting in the gym. I wonder what uh, Rick Ross is alluding to here in this line. Stay Scheming is Rick Ross's collaboration with Drake in French Montana, which was released as a single for Rick Ross's mixtape, Rich Forever in 2012. Ross seemingly makes reference to the song's chorus when claiming I predicted my fate. I ride for my niggas, dog. I ride for my niggas. I slide for my niggas, dog. I slide for my niggas. Uh, stay scheming. Niggas trying to get at me. I ride for my niggas, dog. I ride for my niggas. All right. So towards the outro. Oh, I hate rap genius and all these goddamn ads. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let's go back here. Let's go back here. Okay. So ugh, come on. Come on. Let's get it right. So towards the outro of Champagne Moments, Rick Ross claims Drake sent a cease and desist to French Montana. Rick Ross is showing his loyalty towards French Montana, not switching up on him and staying by his side. I unfollowed you, nigga, because you sent that MFing cease and desist to French Montana. You sent the police, nigga, hating on my dog project. OK, yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Now, the racial angle Rick Ross is going here, uh, making fun of Drake for being uh, light skinned, for being biracial, for being partially white. Uh, this is an interesting angle to go at because I feel like Rick Ross is trying to dig at something that Pusha T tried to get at when he had uh, Rick Ross, when Pusha T was saying like, upset because you're no, when Pusha T said to Drake, upset because your fro couldn't uh, nap enough, uh, uh, tried to do stuff because you wasn't black enough, stuff like that, that he said on uh, Story of Adidon and things like that, right? So this is an angle that people have been attacking uh, Drake in for a long time, and uh, I don't think it proves effective. I do not think attacking Drake for his biraciality uh, partial whiteness is actually effective on making a dent in his career. And y'all tell me if I'm wrong. Of course, I was shocked when I saw the blackface picture with him doing the jazz hands like this. And I laughed at the Pusha T jokes about his nose, his fro, and him parading his father out in a Steve Harvey suit, stuff like that. Like, I find that absolutely funny, but it doesn't prove effective for this reason. Drake's fan base is mostly white folks. The people that ride for Drake the most are mostly white folks or white adjacent folks. And so calling out Drake for not being black enough doesn't matter to the people that will ride for Drake and say Rick Ross is hating, Rick Ross lost, because the battle the battle in hip hop is about public opinion. There's no, you know, score, there's no poll or anything like that. It's just whoever's fan base is the loudest on Twitter, on Instagram and stuff like that. So the white boys who are really going to ride for Drake or the white adjacent boys like the Latinos and the Arabs and all that sort of stuff, they're going to ride for Drake because all these shots about Drake not being black enough, they don't care. They're not black themselves. They're guests in the house of hip hop themselves. So they're looking at all of this stuff, calling Drake white boy, and they're going to be like, so I don't care.
uh, Drake's white, but he's still the greatest rapper of all. The same people who are going to, you know, hate on Rick Ross's diss here or not be affected by Rick Ross calling Drake white boy are the same hip hop fans who say Eminem is the greatest rapper of all time. Sorry, so it, it, this doesn't matter. This is a, a non sequitur in this battle, right? But Rick Ross wants to do this angle because Rick Ross is like, you know, authentically from the hood, authentically, you know, more tied to a black American tradition than Drake, even though Drake's father is black American and Drake supposedly spent, you know, years of his life uh, uh, going to Memphis and spending time in Memphis, which is one of the blackest cities in America. So I find this just very, very interesting how he's attacking it, but it won't be effective on swaying the tide of public opinion, right? <clears throat> I'm going to jump back to the vid <clears throat> to the song one more time and play it one more time for anybody who's late to the live stream. I'm going to play it one more time. I hope y'all can hear it right here. I don't have a fancy setup here. So yeah, let's go. Let's go. I'm going to play it one more time. All right, so that was the diss one more time. Played it one more time. Some more interesting lyrics that I really want to break down here. I feel like the first verse is a lot of filler, right? Maybe this was a, a record Rick Ross had in the hard drive for some time, and then he just decided to work on it and add that second verse on to attack Drake. Though there are some lines here where he does, uh, uh, you know, take some jabs at Drake. Let's break it down. Fish tanks and marble floors living big and bad, a reference to his lifestyle. He lives in that mega mansion in Georgia. Niggas laugh until they hit with my official jab. Okay, so he's saying, like, they're laughing and joking until Rick Ross comes out the gate and starts swinging. 
Uh, crack smoke is the exhaust from my pen and pad, meaning that what he writes is like official, it's sick, it's addictive, like crack cocaine. Ghostwriters, they get to floss what you could have had. All right, so this is a reference to Drake. Of course, there's no annotation here. We know what this means. Uh, and anytime you mention ghostwriters, the first person that comes to your mind is Drake. Record labels taking a loss. Are you in your bag? You a worker wanting the chart. Don't make me laugh. Okay, I interpret this as this him saying that, you know, Cash Money Records, a label that Rick Ross has had beef with because he's got beef with Birdman because Birdman, you know, didn't pay Little Wayne or wouldn't release, let him release like the Carter Five for a long time or something like that, right? So I think he's talking about Cash Money Records, the label that Drake is signed to, right? And that, and still reminding Drake that Drake is a worker, right? Drake likes to come out here and talk big money and all this sort of stuff and tell, you know, Kendrick that he's paying Top Dog 50% of his publishing or royalties for his music. Meanwhile, Drake is still a worker, right? Like Little Wayne gets paid from Drake. Birdman gets paid from Drake. Slim gets paid from Drake, right? Like he's a worker and he's wanting to chart. He's just their most successful worker. Drake is not a boss as he's, in, as I'm understanding these lyrics from Rick Ross. Jump in here. Record label taking a loss. Are you in your bag? You a worker wanting to chart. Don't make me laugh. Let's break this down right here. Read the annotation. These lines are a direct response to uh, rapper Drake who threw shots at Rick Ross on his newly released diss track to various rappers titled Push Ups. Drake shots at Ross. Can't believe he jumping in. This nigga turning 50. Every song that made it on the chart, he got it from Drizzy. Spend that little check you got and stay up out, out my business. Worry about whatever going on with you and okay. Okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. So I didn't interpret the first time I heard Drop and Give Me 50, I didn't interpret those lines as being directed at Rick Ross. I thought they were more directed at Kendrick, talking about how Kendrick got on the charts with Drake's success and Drake's help, or also Future. But I didn't think it was directed at Rick Ross because Future's had a lot of hits, but a lot of those hits have also been with Drake too. So I, I didn't see that at first. So on the first leak of Drake's diss track, instead of a Rick Ross, instead of Rick Ross's, Notably, uh, ad lib Drake, uh, rapped, worry about whatever going on with you and Diddy. Interesting, interesting. So, Drake made a reference, and I didn't hear that in the version I heard last night. I didn't hear Drake reference the, the Diddy situation, which is a whole other fiasco in and of itself. Very interesting because Rick Ross and Diddy are like this, so maybe Rick Ross could get tied up in all of that, but instead, he dropped the uh like how Rick Ross's famous ad lib is very, very interesting. Okay, uh, Drake rapped, worry about whatever going on with you and Diddy, who is a close friend of Rick Ross and is currently being investigated on a series of sexual assault charges, which has been extremely covered by the mainstream media. Drake and Ross have many collabs, such as Aston Martin Music, Stay Scheming, Dice Pineapples, Gold Roses, and many more. Ross's record label, Maybach uh, Music Group, has had several successful artists thrive in the rap scene, such as Meek Mill, French Montana, Wale, and more, yet Drake Drake has not seen the same amount of success as a record label owner for his October's very own, uh, also known as OVO label. Ross is trying not to laugh at how Drake is a chart obsessed, which greatly benefits the mega record label UMG, who signed Drake for $500 million in 2022, but not prioritizing his own label success. In other words, Drake would rather be a worker for UMG than a successful boss for his record label OVO like Ross. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting what Ross is saying here. Ross is saying, like, you might have the chart success, but you're not a boss. You're the top worker at UMG, Universal Music Group. You're the number one earner for other men. Meanwhile, Ross gets to live in the mega mansion in Georgia because all of his artists have been, not all of his artists, but a lot of his artists have been successful. He's got Wale and Meek Mill. He had some other guys like Stolly. He had some other people like Rocky Fresh, but they didn't pop off. But all you need is one or two artists to pop up under you. That's how Lil Wayne is now chilling. Lil Wayne ain't dropping music all the time because at least two or maybe two and a half of his artists really popped off. Tyga popped off. Drake popped off. Nicki Minaj popped off. Drake, uh, Lil Wayne can kick back. Uh, put his feet up in the air, smoke cigars, and chill, right? This is what he's trying to say. This is a very interesting diss, and that's a very interesting dip because, you know, in, in, in Drake's diss, Drop and Give Me 50, he was talking money talk. He was talking big money talk to Kendrick and everybody else, talking about he's a top guy. He's got all the hits, all the success, all the money in the world. But Ross is coming like, you're getting your money in advances. 
you're getting your money, not in in royalty payments because of your successful artists. And it's insane because Drake actually has a lot of people on his label who could be successful. Maji Jordan is talented. Uh, Party Next Door is talented, right? They, he's got a lot of people under him on, on OVO that could have been talented. He could have had the weekend. He fumbled that. Okay. But still, you know, like what is what is going on that Drake is unsuccessful as a boss of his own label? All right. Got to mind. Tell by my watch. I don't know what he's talking about here. Montel. Okay. Anyway, uh, who, uh, run up on you and snatch your chain. Watch your bitches bleed. Is this a reference to a real chain snatching? Are, if we're snatching chains, this beef is getting ridiculous here. Rick Ross responds to Drake's diss uh, pushups. You won't ever take no chain off of us. Okay. So he's referring directly back to that. It seems like Rick Ross dropped this diss as soon as he heard it. He put his pen to pat. Okay. I like this hip hop thing. I like this hip hop thing because he's referring back directly to Lion. So I take back what I said earlier that Ross had this just in the chamber and started to just release it by tacking on a second verse. No, Ross heard that original diss and decided I'm going to put in work and reply to them lines. So Drake said in drop and give me 50, you won't ever take no chain off of us. And Ross said, I'll take the chain and watch you bitches bleed. Interesting. Drake was originally responding to Kendrick Lamar's diss from his verse on Like That by Future and Metro Boomin. Got two T's with me. I'm snatching chains and burning tattoos. It's up. Uh, Rick Ross seemingly sides with Future, Metro Boomin, and Kendrick Lamar over Drake, stating that they will be snatching chains no matter what Drake says. <laughs> oh, God. Rick Ross was featured on Metro Boomin's collaboration. We don't trust you on the song Everyday Hustle. I have to say this once, once again. We don't want this diss... Uh, dissing back and forth between the artists in this rap civil war to get violent. We don't want it to get violent. No chain snatching. Chain snatching is what got Tupac killed. You get what I'm saying? Like, long story short, a death row member got their chain snatched. Uh, Pac saw the guy who snatched the chain, swung on him at MGM uh, Casino in Las Vegas. Uh, a few hours later, he's killed, right? We don't want that to happen in hip hop. Drake doesn't, shouldn't, doesn't deserve to get hurt. Rick Ross doesn't deserve to get hurt. Kendrick doesn't deserve to get hurt. Nobody deserves to get hurt in this beef. So let's put the chain talk, chain snatching talk aside. Let's put the baby mama talk aside. Let's put all the all that other stuff aside and let's just rap. Please, please. We want hip hop to be successful and thrive. We want all of y'all to make millions of dollars and just entertain us. But no chain snatching, please. I don't who wants an OVO chain? Really, who wants a who really wants an OVO chain? Okay. All right. Feel the pain and just describe when you really ride. Either you niggas getting money or ready to die. Uh B.I.G. give a fuck if you chi Ali. So uh this is a reference to like B.I.G. Like Rick Ross is comparing himself to notorious B.I.G., a rapper he's always trying to emulate or chase after the success or the aesthetic of. And Chi Ali was like an unsuccessful rapper in the 90s <clears throat> who caught a body, right? Like Chi Ali, I believe, is this guy who, you know, had like one minor, minor hit in like the late 90s, uh, caught a body and went on the run for like a few years, got caught and sent and sent to jail. And now he's out and free. So I think he's trying to say, I'm B.I.G. I'm, you know, the biggest rapper, the greatest rapper. And you're you might be a real gangster. Right. But you're not you know, successful or lyrical like me. That's how I'm interpreting that line. But I'm going to break it down and see what the people are saying on Rap Genius about this. So Amish to B.I.G.'s classic album, Ready to Die, that's all they're breaking it down as. But I don't think that's a good reference to make because Biggie died and Chi Ali caught a body. So I think Ross is setting himself up for if Drake wants to reply to say, okay, you want to compare yourself to B.I.G.? Are you ready to die? Do you want life after death? You get what I'm saying? Uh, very dangerous talk here. So you got it and you keep it uh, tucked if you buy me. Do the job better known as the Charles Schwab. Double R spread through the yard and I swear to God. Okay. I got you got it tucked. You got the straps. Once again, I don't like this strap talk. Whether it's guns or jewelry, Drake will normally have to stay put in front of a senior of his like Ross. More than a brag, this line could be interpreted as an example of their past relationship as Ross would take care of anything Drake needed. In a sense, Ross would have probably taken smoke for him if uh, need had been. So, uh, yeah, I think he's referring to either straps like you got to keep it tucked if you buy me like you better be prepared. You got to be armed and dangerous whenever Ross comes around, or you better tuck, tuck your jewelry. You better hide it because they're snatching chains and making bitches bleed. Okay. Uh, double R's for through your, the yard. And I swear to God. So yeah, Rick Ross is referring to his, uh, car collection, you know, um, uh, 
you know, the 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 Rolls Royces and stuff like that. Uh, niggas leaking their records when we speaking directly. If we keep in a gangster, when you see me, you check me. So he's talking about how Drake leaked these records. You know, he leaked the two records, two versions of Drop and Give Me 50 last night. And uh, yeah, so I think also Rick Ross might take offense to the Drop and Give Me 50 because, of course, Drake, I mean, Rick Ross and 50 Cent have had beef for years and they still have not squashed it, right? They're still bickering back and forth about baby mamas. And I believe uh, uh, 50 Cent had to pay like... Rick Ross's baby mama, like millions of dollars for leaking a sex tape of her and stuff like that. So it's gotten real nasty. So I think, you know, Drake, once again, was playing like 4D chess by making the reference to 50 Cent throughout the uh, disc that he dropped to Kendrick last night. And Rick Ross is also taking offense to that, right? So yeah, I'm going to read here. So on April 13th, Drake's diss song push-ups uh, to multiple artists who were against him, including Rick Ross, leaked. Ross claims either Drake or someone in his camp leaked the record on his behalf as he too scared to speak up directly. That's the thing. A lot of people were saying last night that the Drake diss might be AI. Some people were saying the Drake diss might be AI or it might be fake and stuff like that. And he's, and Ross is replying that, you know, either this is fake or you're too scared to actually come outside and drop these disses because you're worried about, you know, us really coming at you and exposing you and attacking you. So once again, the white boy, this is the first time Rick Ross says white boy in the song. White boy, I see you. I see you. Yeah, check. So Drake being the child of a white mother and a black father is considered biracial and therefore light skin. Rick Ross takes uh, jabs at Ross's uh, Rick Ross takes jabs at Drake's complexion in a similar fashion as Pusha T on May uh, 2018's uh, The Story of Adidon. Confused, always felt you weren't black enough, afraid to grow it because your fro wouldn't nap enough. So yeah, this picture of Drake, you know, with the black face, uh, you know, stuff like that, and Rick and Pusha T poking holes in his black identity was very, very powerful in The Story of Adidon. But once again, this does not matter to a lot of people. It does not matter to a lot of people because a lot of hip hop fans are white and it, talking about black issues or talking about blackness amongst white hip hop fans doesn't matter because white folks don't even care about blackness. Most white folks don't even love black people. So when they see this, they're like, oh, OK, he's not black. That makes me like him even more. Most white folks think the greatest rapper of all time is Eminem. So Rick Ross just saying that, well, Drake is not black enough, that only fuels the fire of them saying, yeah, yeah, he's not black. That's why he's even better than you, N-word. Like most, unfortunately, a lot of white hip hop fans don't even love black people. So they're going to see all these shots at Drake's blackness as, you know, even more proof of their uh, uh, anti-black racism, right? Uh, continuing here. This is the second verse where Rick Ross really goes in. Getting bullied, don't walk up on me because the clip is fully. Niggas pussy don't want to push me. I'm like really woody. So yeah, uh, Rick Ross is saying here that uh, Drake, you know, got bullied in school, that he was a punk. He's always been a punk, right? That's why he's soft. Uh, I think that's what he's referencing here. Uh, like his moves, but he never had a fight in school. Always ran. Another nigga had to write your grooves. Flow is copy and paste. Wheezy gave you the juice. Another white boy at the park want to hang with the crew. So he's saying here that, uh, you know, Drake has always just wanted to be down. He's always been the outsider and stuff like that. And they've always seen him as such, but they only kept him around because Wheezy gave him the juice. Wheezy gave him the backup. Wheezy was the one who solidified him, right? Because if you don't know, Wheezy is Little Wayne. Unfortunately, I have a lot of white folks on my channel who don't know what the hell is going on here. So yeah, this is what he's talking about here. Like his moves, but he never had a fight in school. So so uh, I don't know if he's talking about Degrassi directly, but that's how I'm interpreting it. Always ran. Another nigga had to write your grooves. More ghostwriter allegations right here. Uh, more ghostwriter uh, talk right here. Flow is copy and paste. Wheezy gave you the juice. So Pulitzer Prize winner. So I find this interesting. Pulitzer Prize winner switching up like dyed denim. He's referring to Kendrick Lamar. There's no way because the only rapper to ever win a Pulitzer Prize is Kendrick Lamar. Now, is he dissing Kendrick Lamar? Or is he saying, like, Kendrick Lamar switched up on you uh, like dyed denim? Get incentives for all the killings while we ride Reynolds. Okay, I want to break this down. Likely a reference to Kendrick Lamar. Hold on, wait. Likely a reference to Kendrick Lamar releasing the future uh, feature after being taunted for years by Drake. Okay, so he's just referencing Kendrick Lamar, but it also feels a bit like a diss. Switching up like dyed denim. So Pulitzer Prize winner switching up like dyed denim. Is, is Ross saying that Kendrick is switching up on him? I don't know. Very interesting. Get incentives for all the killings while we ride rentals. Look me right in my face. He beginning to shake. Told you niggas, stay scheming. I predicted my fate. Got more money than you. Fuck you, want me to say. 50 mil for the crib. Where you want me to stay? All right. I don't know. 
what he's trying to reference here. Of course, Ross got a mega mansion in Georgia somewhere. But yeah, uh, Ross is the proud owner of one of the largest private homes in America. Okay, absolutely. Uh, great. I can shoot up my block. I can shoot up the block. I got pictures to paint. Let you. Okay, I think referencing here. I think he's referencing the issue that he had a few weeks ago where like one of his neighbor's house was on fire or something like that. And he was like taking like Instagram videos or something like that. 50 mil for the crib where you want me to say I can shoot up the block, meaning I can shoot images on my block. I got pictures to paint. Right. So I think he's trying to reference here. Like I can do what I want on this mega mansion on this land that I own. If you don't know what I'm referencing, just type in, you know, 50 cent um, uh, Rick Ross uh, uh, situation or 50, Rick Ross drama house burning down in his neighborhood. You'll find it. It's easy to look up. Anyway, let you DM my hoe, got, but got bitches you can't. So yeah, once again, I read this before. He's referencing how Drake took you know his baby mama on stage or something like that. It's getting real messy. Let's leave the women out of this. I know y'all are beefing over women, but let's put, the, put that to a side and let's focus just on the bars. All right. So yeah, he referenced he has a he has a, a sample here of Drake at a concert uh talking about much he loves Rick Ross. Uh yeah, all a blur tour. All right, so you ain't never want to be a nigga anyway, nigga. So yeah, he's taking more shots at Drake's uh race. Rick Ross here takes a shot at Drake for being insecure about his prominent black Afro-American features to the point in which Drake took matters into his own hands to get it surgically innovated, using the term father knows to get the point across. As Drake's father, Dennis Graham, is a black man with a significantly large nose. If you look closely, you can see that Drake's nose was a bit more plum and stubby in 2011, first image, than it is now. Now in 2024, where it's a bit more narrow and longer. Interesting. So did Drake actually, did Drake actually have rhinoplasty? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think your nose and features change over time. But if he did, if he didn't, because the one part of your body, you have two parts of your body that keep growing, your nose and your ears. Your nose and ears will continue to grow as you get older. That's why if you look at old people, they have some of the biggest ears, right? Sometimes taking up the entire side of their head, right? <laughs> the longer you live. So I think Drake's nose might have changed, uh, but Drake has definitely had surgery, right? He's got the lipo belly button. So <laughs> yeah, Drake has definitely been touched up on. He's a bad bitch. <laughs> Surgical summer. <laughs> All right, so this gives Rick Ross artillery for the rest of the verse, going to taunt Drake's various other times for being white due to Drake embracing and changing himself to fit white standards instead of staying true to what he once was. Once again, guys, it might sound like I'm caping for Drake, like I'm some big Drake uh, fan. I'm actually not. I like Rick Ross's music better than uh, Drake's. I like Kendrick Lamar's music better than Drake's in general, but I do think it's a bit unfair for the whole industry to pile on Drake for what it seems like trivial reasons. I think it's simply because he's been on top for so long and also the women that all of them incestuously sleep with together. So they're beefing over women. They're beefing over being on top. That's what all of this comes down to. That's how I'm interpreting what Rick Ross is saying here. All right, so I am followed you, nigga, because you sent that motherfucking cease and desist to French Montana. See, I, I I think this is just petty. Like like I said, this is just petty. But if it's petty and if it's a good reason to get in the booth and spar with the bars, I'm with it. That wasn't the same white boy that I seen, nigga, when we were making them early records, nigga. When you were happy to be around niggas, seeing niggas holding them sticks. Yeah, you owe motherfucking stun of your life, nigga. Give Wheezy some money, nigga. Uh, give Rap a lot some money. I find this interesting that Rick Ross is saying right here that uh, Drake should give more money to Birdman, AKA Stunner, right? Because Birdman and Rick Ross have had beef for years, but even, even Rick Ross has given it up like, yo, you owe Birdman your life. You owe Wheezy your life. You owe rap -a -Lot your life. And you know, Drake, meanwhile, is making a ton of money for UMG, a white owned record label, right? So yeah, I think that's what he's trying to say here. Like, you know, Drake is white, not in just the sense that he wants to change his black nose or change his black features, right? He also is white in the sense he gives his money to the white folks rather than actually to the black men that helped uh, Drake get into positions of power. This is a very interesting disc. But once again, calling Drake white boy, 
calling Drake white boy does not matter to a lot of white hip hop fans because a lot of white hip hop fans don't even love black people and they view Eminem as a goat. So they're just seeing Drake as white as being one of them and more proof for their anti-black racism. Continuing here. So yeah, biggest it's Rose nigga. You can do it how you want to do it, where you want to do it. Anytime you want to do it. I'm ready. I'm ready. White boy. Huh? I know you got your dockers on with no underwear. White boy. I find this hilarious. That is just a hilarious. That's the funniest line. I know you got your dockers on with no underwear. White boy. <laughs> That's hilarious. I just find that hilarious. I'm going to keep it real. Sometimes I wear, I wear, I go, I go uh, free balling. I'd be free balling, man. Cause underwear is constricting. And you know what I'm saying? And when you got a lot of meat like me, I don't, I have yet to find a pair of underwear that really accommodates what I'm packing. You feel me? So I, I get uncomfortable wearing underwear. So sometimes I don't be wearing underwear, not with jeans, of course, that's nasty. And not in a suit, of course. But like, if I'm going to the gym or if I'm just like outside playing ball or just going for a walk, sometimes I just be, you know, free balling, especially like I'm wearing some hooping shorts or something like that. I let it breathe, man. I got to let it breathe. I don't know if that makes me white. <laughs> I just be, I got to keep it real with y'all, but, uh, Dockers on with no underwear. That's hilarious. So yeah, you had that surgery, that six pack gone. That's why you wearing that funny ish at your show. You can't hide it, nigga. White boy. Okay. That's hilarious. So he's saying like Drake, you know, got the six pack with the surgical summer. <laughs> Drake shared a shirtless photo on his Instagram story, sparking speculation among fans. He had cosmetic work done. Rumors have been circulating since about 2019. The image shows Drake with nothing more than a towel wrapped around his waist. And this was what Drake got the ab stretching done, right? And this is the thing. I feel like men, if you're going to have cosmetic surgery, you got to be honest about it. And it's okay, right? People roasted band man Kevo for getting lipo and ab stretching done. But men, you know, it's it, there's nothing wrong with getting the fat sucked out of your body. It's probably a healthy thing too. And Drake probably should just admit that. But, you know, him doing the sideways photo showing the, the washboard abs that he paid for, it's not a good look unless you admit it and unless you talk honestly about it, right? Uh, Drake has been an innovator in many ways. So yeah, if you want to be an innovator, you just got to stand on what you innovate. Drake then <laughs> with the bird chest and the sl uh, slight beer belly. And then Drake now, right? With a bunch of tattoos. And I'm surprised Drake got all those tattoos, right? Uh, continuing here. Ross calls out Drake for wearing questionable clothing on his tour, probably because of surgery, he mentions. So yeah, Drake's body has returned back to its normal form because the hot girl summer he was having wore off, right? The BBL uh, dropped. <laughs> the BBL popped, <laughs> as Remy Ma said. So what is Drake wearing? Yeah, he's be wearing some crazy clothes on tour, right? So yeah, I think that's what Ross is trying to get at here. It's all fun and games. I like what Ross did. It's a cool diss. Uh, it has a nice beat. Uh, very interesting jabs, the way Ross is attacking Drake. Uh, I really like Rick Ross music. I feel like he's one of the top lyricists that doesn't get respect. He's underrated as a lyricist, has dropped so many classic songs like Tears of Joy, uh, Freemason. Uh, man, Rick Ross is one of those guys. And I don't think there's any ghostwriting allegations against him. So I have to put him above Drake in my you know, ranking of greatest rappers of all time. But this this was just, I, I don't think some of it was effective. I think some of it was. The boss talk was effective, but the racial jokes were not effective against Drake. So let's go here, because Ross is not the only one attacking Drake. All of the subs aimed at Drake on We Still Don't Trust You. Our ASAP Rocky in the weekend dissing Drake on Future and Metro Boomin's new album, We Dug Through the Lyrics. This was published on April 12, 2024 by Jordan Rose for Complex.com. Once again, I don't know where all the Drake hate is coming from. Where is all the Drake hate coming from? Because all we know, like Ross said, oh, you sent a cease and desist to French Montana. But I really think it's about women. It's always about women with these guys because all these guys sleep with the same four or five strippers in Miami, right? Why are y'all beefing over them? Y'all are millionaires. Y'all are multi-platinum selling artists who are men at the top of their field, beefing over women, over pillow talking and stuff like that. It's real petty. But I find this highly interesting and I do believe it's healthy for hip hop. So Future and Metro Boomin's new album, We Still Don't Trust You, is packed with even more smoke for Drake, but this time for new players. After Kendrick came after Drake on We Don't Trust You, Future and Metro Boomin enlisted ASAP Rocky and The Weeknd to join them in poking and prodding the boy. On Rocky's show of hands verse, he seemingly calls for all the dogs a flop and pokes at, at a shared 
dating history, and that The Weeknd croons through some spicy lyrics that people are interpreting as shots at Drake on All to Myself. Future also has more to say to Drake, sending him some subliminal shots on a few different songs throughout the album. This adds to a laundry list of artists who have been potentially feuding with Drake following the release of We Don't Trust You. With plenty of sneaky lyrics to wade through, here are all of the subs aimed at Drake on We Still Don't Trust You. Absolutely insane that Drake is going through all of this. I wonder what his strategy will be. Will he release a diss song for everybody? What do y'all think in the live stream chat? Do you think Drake will attack everybody? Is he winning right now? Was dropping Give Me 50 like a, a really good haymaker and pace setter for what this beef will be? Y'all let me know what you think the temperature will be and how Drake will attack this issue. Because like I said at the beginning of this live stream, we've never seen one rapper get attacked from 50 different angles, right? It's a 20 V1, like he said on dropping Give Me 50. I've never, this didn't happen to Jay-Z, this didn't happen to 50 Cent, this didn't happen to Lil Wayne. Nobody has ever all ganged up on one rapper, right? This is a jumping. This is a jumping, like at school, right? All four people. Anyway, let's read through ASAP Rocky's diss right here. This is the song, Show of Hands. ASAP Rocky sends some of the album's most direct shots at Drake on Show of Hands when he raps, Call up Pluto Metro, should have put me on the first one. Niggas in their feelings over women, what, you hurt or something? I smashed before you birthed, son. Flacco hit it first, son. Still don't trust you, it's always us, never them. Heard you dropped your latest shit. Funny how it just came and went. Okay, all right. Uh, ASAP Rocky was really talking. Now, ASI Rocky, I re I used to listen to him back in the day, like when he dropped that mixtape, um, man, Purple Swag or something like that, uh, man, uh, uh, Unk from H-Town, stuff like that, like that song he did with Schoolboy Q, Brand New Guy, that mixtape, I forgot the exact name of that mixtape, but that's a classic to me, but ASI Rocky has sort of fell off, his moment is gone, he's not in anybody's big, he is not in he is far from the big three. He is far from the big three. He's far from one of those guys, but he's still an important player, right? Uh, so Stink Garbage said, and you can take your race trader wife with you since she seems to love the jungle so much. P.S. She needs a nose job. So... Uh, ASAP. All right. So Stink George jumped into the chat and just wanted to send racial comments to me as if that was effective towards me. Uh, I don't know what else he said before that because he said, and and his message didn't go through before. But Stink George, I want to thank you for subscribing. Thank you for helping the channel grow and all that sort of stuff. The white supremacists have nothing else to do but resort to name calling because none of their arguments actually hold up and actually trying to discuss anything constructively. We're having a hip hop conversation here, Stink George. So if you really stink, if you're really nasty, if you really bout it, I encourage you to come on my channel. We can have a debate on actual white supremacy, on actual anti-black racism, and you can get off all your stupid white supremacist talking points. But if you rather sit in your mother's basement or sit in some dwelling in some third world country or sit in the uh uh, sit in the confines of your dilapidated, rundown, uh, stupid hometown in the deep south of America or wherever you're hiding in the world, Stink George. You're more than welcome just to continue to comment and help the channel grow, help the algorithm, and that sort of stuff here. Now, continuing to ASAP Rocky, I think these disses to uh, to Drake were sort of effective in a way because For All the Dogs got panned by critics when it dropped. For All the Dogs did not make a dent on anybody at all. So uh, niggas in their feelings over women, what you heard of some yeah so he's really taking a dig at what the rest of the world is saying about drake why are you constantly obsessed about other men you know sleeping with women that you couldn't get and that sort of stuff so yeah i find this very very interesting because the rest of the world is like drake why why are you still obsessed about rihanna he's still throwing shots at rihanna to this day talking about sex with you is so average in, in reference to uh rihanna's song sex with me is so amazing and stuff like that uh uh very interesting that uh rocky wanted to be involved in the first disc. I think Rocky wanted to get involved on Call Up Pluto Metro. You should have had me on the first one. I think, you know, he's trying to say like, yeah, I should have been on the first like that. I should have been on uh, We Don't Trust You, the first one, because I wanted to get shots off on Drake too. Uh, I smashed before you birth, son. So this is, a, this is a low blow here. This is what we don't like. This is what we don't like in hip hop. We don't like when people are talking about their baby mothers and stuff like that. Or I smashed your I smashed your baby mother before you uh, <clears throat> uh, before she gave birth to your son and stuff like that. We don't like that at all. So very very uh, low blow here. But if he's referencing that he slept with Sophie. Uh, uh, Sophie knows better before she gave birth to Adonis, Drake's son. That's a low blow. Flacco hit it first, son. 
Very, very interesting right here. Very, very interesting. All right. Uh, still don't trust you. It's always us, never them. Heard you drop your last shit. Funny how it came and went. Yeah, for all the dogs sort of came and went, Drake had to add on some extra songs at the end of it, which were actually hard. Like the addition to the For All My Dogs, like, like the deluxe version with those like five or six extra songs is actually very, very good. And you should check those out if you have the time. Jump into the comments here. Stink George is still in the comments. He sent an emoji with a, with a hand sign or something like that. I guess he is scared to actually show his face because most of the white supremacists are actually P-U-S-S-Y. They're too scared to actually say their ideas outside in public, which is why they have to hide in the corners on the internet. Me, I show my handsome, melanated face every day on this channel. I talk about issues on this channel and I'm willing to debate anybody on anything I say on this channel, fight for the ideas that I put out here on this channel and willing to talk to anybody. Meanwhile, uh, Stink George, who is a woman, who is a feminine man, who is unable to actually articulate his point of views in actual constructive ways, is a loser, is a neckbeard, is the worst type of man that could ever exist because he has no testosterone. He has no bravery. He has no courage. He has to hide behind avatars and racist memes online. Meanwhile, a strong, handsome, melanated black man like myself is able to do things he could never imagine because he is ignorant, he is retarded, he is stupid. Continuing here. Uh, so all my messages are blocked. That's because, Stink George, you're unable to articulate yourself in a constructive way. You are a stupid white man. You are probably the dumbest type of white man that ever existed. You called me a caveman, but you literally cannot write an attack on me in a way that YouTube can uh, uh, not censor. That shows how ignorant and dumb you are and how inarticulate you are in the English language, a language that presumably you should be able to speak better than me because you're the high IQ individual that surpasses any African's uh, intellect could ever be. Right. So Stink George, all you can make is monkey memes. All you can say is negative things. But you, Stink George, are the type of person who will always be below a person like me because you cannot even actually articulate yourself in a way that is constructive. The white supremacists say negative things about black people. They call us monkeys. They call us ignorant. They call us violent. They call us uh, all these sorts of things. But it's really a projection because whenever you actually debate or interact with the white supremacists, they act the same way they say we act. They're unable to control their emotions. They're unable to actually write anything intelligent. Stink George is a pussy. He stinks because his mother had a rotten pussy and pushed him out into the world. And now he has to just continue to perpetuate his vile, uh, ratchet ways to the rest of us. His rancid uh, presence on humanity is a scourge to all of us. And we should eradicate people like Stink George and anybody who thinks like him. All right. So uh, continuing here, Rocky's bar about future and Metro should have put him on the first one. Has fans speculating the duo called in even more artists to send shots at Drake on this new album. When Rocky says, I smash before you birth, son, Flacco hit it first, son. He doesn't name any names, but people are interpreting it to mean that he has uh, he was with Drake's baby mother, Sophie Brousseau, before the birth of their child, Adonis. And there were rumors in 2018, around the same time as the Pusha T versus Drake beef, that some supports this claim. He goes on to throw shade at Drake's last album for all the dogs before he closes the song with fuck keeping the shit hip hop. I want to see a fuck nigga bleed out. Okay. 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 This is getting this is the see this is getting nasty. And now I'm understanding why J. Cole wanted to drop out all of this. Now I'm understanding why J. Cole wanted to drop out this beef because it's starting to get nasty here. Because, you know, Flacco talking about fuck keeping this hip hop. I want to see a fuck nigga bleed out. OK, yeah, that's uh, that's not cool. That's not cool. We we shouldn't be talking like that about other black men who are successful, who are uh, uh, making it in uh, in this industry, in this world that is that is against black life and black expression. All of them are are wildly surpassing uh, the expectations that the, the white supremacist world puts on them, making millions of dollars, being able to take care of their families and generations of their family members and that sort of stuff. We shouldn't be talking about killing other black men in hip hop when we have this hip hop beef going on, right? Uh, let's keep it hip hop. We don't want to see anybody bleed out. I understand why Drake wanted, I mean, why J. Cole wanted to bow out now. So uh, so why does Rocky have, uh, have smoke for Drake? Well, fans originally speculated 
speculated that Drake had dissed Rihanna and Rocky on 2023's Fear of Heights when he sang about his past experiences with Rihanna. Why they make it sound like I'm still hung up on you. That could never be. Gal can't run me better than him than me. Better it's not me. I'm anti. I'm anti. Yeah, and the sex was average with you. Yeah, I'm anti because I had it with you. Ooh, okay. <laughs> okay, interesting, interesting. So, yeah, I, I missed this because I don't really keep up with, uh, you know, Drake's music as much. But him dissing Rihanna is, is as bad as Eminem, who continued to diss Mariah Carey. Like, it makes no sense. It makes no sense for men to be so obsessed with women that they diss them on rap songs. And Drake, this is uh, this is just low blow. Like Rihanna was years ago, literally almost a decade ago that he dated her. And he is still talking to Rihanna this way. Why they make it sound like I'm still hung up on you? That could never be. Gal can't run me. Better him than me. Better it's not me. I'm anti. I'm anti. Yeah, and the sex was average with you. Yeah, I'm anti because I had it with you. Cut. Okay, I'm auntie like your daddy's sister. Auntie like a family picture and I had my way better bitches than you TBH uh yeah that man he will st he's still with you he can't leave y'all go on vacation I bet it's Antilles okay so Drake you start off the bar by saying why are they saying like why pe why I'm still hung up on you why are people saying I'm obsessed with you and then you spend the next eight bars obsessing over the woman absolutely insane absolutely insane Drake is obsessing over Rihanna the way Stink George obsesses over my black penis it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Like, if you hate somebody or if you don't care about somebody, why would you continue to talk about them or talk to them through records and stuff like that? Just like the white supremacists, like Stink George. Stink George is obsessed with black men's penises. He secretly wants to suck a black man's penis. He secretly wants to be able to fillet a black man because he feels so inferior as a white supremacist. And I believe the same thing about Drake, too. Drake secretly wishes he was ASAP Rocky because Rihanna to him is probably the only woman that qualifies for or that matches his stature and presence in the game and is also a very beautiful woman too. Drake wants desperately to be like Jay-Z. Drake desperately wants to be able to say he has a queen on his arm, but yet and still he's failed in his love life and got stuck with a, you know, one jump off who, you know, got pregnant and didn't want to have the abortion. And y'all forget, y'all might have forgotten, but Drake tried to beg Sophie to have an abortion. I believe those text messages leaked uh, a few years ago, right? Right before Adonis uh, was born, like they were talking like in text messages and they leaked out to the public. Drake tried to kill his own son. So, yeah. And on another late night, Drake even mentioned Rocky by name rapping i ain't pretty flacco bitch this shit will get rocky with this context show of hands might be rocky's way of responding to that verse implying that he was with the mother of drake's child first after drake had gloated about being with rihanna first mm, interesting interesting so like i said this beef over women is so silly it's absolutely so silly that these guys are going at it over women like this like Drake is saying, I slept with Rihanna first. And then Rocky's like, oh, I slept with your baby mama first. Like, it's just so nasty. It's just so nasty. I could not imagine being in an industry where these guys are trading STDs this regularly amongst each other. Let's go here to The weekend. So the weekend song all by myself. Now the weekend and Drake have had a very interesting relationship for a long time. So instead of making his potential subs at Drake sound venomous, the weekend does what he does best and sings the disses like an angel on the fluttery all to myself, which samples the Isley brothers. Let's stay together on the track. Abel croons. They could never diss my brothers, baby. When they got leaks in my pr operation, I thank God that I never signed my life away and we never do the big talk. They shooters making TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Weekend's really talking here. The weekend does what he does best. Okay, so the weekend going at Drake, I find this, you know, probably is probably one of the most deep seated beefs in this whole situation. Of course, Future and Drake's beef goes back, you know, a long time, right? Even though they've collaborated together, you know. Drake at the beginning of Future's career didn't want to give him props, didn't want to give him the shine because he didn't show up for the Tony Montana remix video, even though Drake promised Future he would do that. And uh, Drake never followed up on uh, What a Time to Be Alive Part 2, but he dropped the 21 Savage album out of nowhere. So I feel like Drake has always sort of sidelined Future and used him, you know, when it was convenient. Meanwhile, Future is like, bro, like, we're supposed to be brothers, we're supposed to be collaborators and stuff like that. And that never you know, fully fleshed out. Meanwhile, The weekend, right, for Drake 
has always been sort of like competition. And The weekend, to some degree, has surpassed Drake, right? And The weekend, in my imp- opinion, has su- su- surprised me in so many ways, right? Because I remember listening to House of Balloons when it dropped and thinking this guy is dope, but I didn't think he would grow to be a mega pop star like the way he was. I thought his music was amazing, but I'm still so surprised that The Weeknd is who he is in the world and that sort of stuff. And so, you know, this beef with Drake is probably competitive on just about being on the charts and stuff like that, but it's also about possibly women, possibly about uh, Drake being salty. The weekend never signed to him and, and became a part of the OVO sweatshop. Like the weekend is like the, the symbol of what any of the artists on OVO could have been had they not been signed to Drake and just been under Drake, right? Maji, Jordan, Party Next Door, all these guys, they could be actually huge because they all actually have talent. But The weekend broke out of that. So they could never diss my brother's baby when they got leaks in the operation. So I think he's referencing that, you know, people around Drake are leaking information to The weekend and other people. I thank God that I never signed my life away. So he's saying, like, thank God I never, you know, uh, signed to OVO. And thank God he never did that. Thank God he never, you know, was just under Drake because he would have constantly been uh, uh, the second in command. He would have probably never been as big, honestly. And I truly believe that. And they never do the big talk. They shooters making TikToks. Okay. The first portion of the verse, they could never diss my brothers, is likely a reference to Drake inevitably re- retaliating against Future and Metro. While the line about being thankful that he never signed his life away could be alluding to the fact he chose not to sign with OVO back in 2011 and instead helped to write much of Take Care. Fans are also speculating that the line about shooters making TikToks is a jab at Drake's mob persona being a farce, as soon as some have pointed to his old bodyguard artist, Baka Not Nice, making TikToks. <laughs> this is great. This is great. I love the jabs here. I love the jokes. I love the little back and forth and the petty stuff, right? I love it. I love it. It's absolutely funny, right? Once again, I said this in the live stream about J. Cole apologizing. I don't understand why all these guys now who were nice guy rappers at first, Kendrick, Drake, J. Cole, they're talking about switches, sticks, extendos, all that sort of stuff. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for these guys to make this 180 like this, where they're now talking big, big gangster ish. But uh, yeah, if you talk big gangster ish, people are going to poke holes at it. And it's nobody's more easier to talk that uh, nobody's easier to attack when they start talking that way than Drake, because we all know his background, him as a child star in Degrassi and stuff like that. And Baka not nice doing TikToks. I find that hilarious. All right. Uh, Drake and The Weeknd have a long and complicated relationship that dates back over a decade on his 2019 song war drake even rapped about how they just had to fix things alluding to on on again off again tensions over the years and fans are speculating that abel is taking advantage of this moment to express his persisting frustrations with drake i would like to see i would like to see these guys get back into the studio because future no weekend and drake make magic together like loving the crew crew love great song all the songs they did the zone great song. These guys are really great together and it will be good for Canadian unity, like Toronto unity to see these guys together and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I would like to see that happen. But, you know, until this civil war ends, I think it's going to continue to be this way. Let's talk to uh, Future right here. So Future, I covered what their issue is. I I just find this so crazy because Future sort of like jumped out of nowhere because Future comes across as a guy who doesn't really want beef, doesn't want tension, but yet and still he seems to get caught up in this. And I think he's in it for the long haul too. But Future is probably the weakest link lyrically in this whole thing. Like Future's disses to Drake are just going to be like mumbled, half mumbled, like lean ramblings, right? <laughs> so so the songs he dissed them on nights like this, number one, Nobody Know My Struggle, and This Sunday. After dropping a bunch of subs at Drake on We Still Don't Trust You, Future finds a special pocket in the third verse on nights like this, where he could be sending more shots. It'd be times when I'd be honest, people take me for granted. It'd be times when I'm alone, I know I need my sanity. It was times I never should have gave away my energy, should have saved my energy, made me stronger, new enemies. Okay, so I think future, the way he's writing here, it comes across as somewhat like hurt, like hurt that he invested so much time in that relationship with Drake and being friends with Drake. And yet, and still he feels like betrayed by Drake. 
you know, doing the album with 21 Savage, Drake not doing the follow up to What a Time to Be Alive. So, yeah, I think that sounds like that. People are speculating that these could be allusions to Future recently falling out with Drake, thus making new enemies. Future opens the second disc on the album, number one intro with a clip from Drake's known adversary, Charlemagne the God. Are they still adversaries? Because Drake sent bottles to Charlemagne. Are they still beefing? I don't think so. To be more to be more specific, it's a soundbite from a recent episode of the Brilliant Idiots podcast where Charlemagne sings Future's praises. I think Future had influence. People want to be Future. People want to sound like Future. It's wild to me that we don't. It's not a big three. It's a fantastic four. And Future is in that. You can put him. He might be two, three. He might, can be even number one. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. I, If you want to say the Fantastic Four, I don't think... I think this whole big three or Fantastic Four conversation is hella disrespectful to the women outside who are rapping. Because, like... <clears throat> Seriously, if we're really talking about big three, at least two of them got to be women, right? Two of them, Megan Thee Stallion, Doja Cat, and Drake. Let's keep it absolutely a buck. Let's keep it absolutely real. The big three is actually Megan, Doja, Drake. J. Cole dropped what? His hot album, like what, two years ago now? But we're still putting him in the big three. Megan really be rapping, rapping. But y'all don't give her the respect because she talks about, you know, making dudes eat a coochie. Let's keep it absolutely a buck. If we're talking about the five hottest rappers right now, at least two of them are women. We got Drake, J. Cole, Kendrick, Doja Cat, Megan Thee Stallion. And to be honest, to be honest, Megan outside really rapping, rapping. Cardi really outside really rapping, rapping. You might not like Nicki Minaj, but she still is dropping records, right? And Nicki Minaj actually got bars if she really wanted to. So this whole big three thing is very uh, macho. It's, it's very unrealistic when we really sit back and realize who's outside putting work, who's outside dropping albums, who's outside releasing singles, who's outside demolishing features, who's really, who's really killing it. And I got to keep it real, even though I don't listen to their music enough, Doja had a number one hit, Paint the Town Red. Megan Thee Stallion went to war with Nicki and dropped one of the hardest lines this year. These hoes not upset at Megan, they upset at Megan's Law. Are we really just going to disregard Megan Thee Stallion's work that she's putting outside right here? Drake got beef with Megan Thee Stallion. I wish Megan Thee Stallion jumped in this and shut down everybody. She, and she say, all you niggas pussy, because all of y'all diss me for getting shot by Tory Lanez. I really, really wish Megan jumped into the chat, because Megan, if anybody's got beef with Drake right now, it's Megan, for real, for real. Because Megan uh, got shot by Tory Lanez. Tory Lanez is doing a decade in jail right now. And Drake was like, this ho these hoes lying. These hoes lying. Like, in referencing to Megan the Stallion getting shot. Absolutely uh, not cool. So, go in here to the comments here. Schooner Dorshaw said, hello, I'm sorry you're dealing with racists. Love the channel. How are you doing today, uh, brother? Praise God. Alhamdulillah. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Hey, there are racist white supremacists all over the world, and unfortunately, Stink George is one of those uh, sorts of people. He's a, a, a person with few brain cells who has few opportunities, so he has to hate on intelligent, handsome, successful black men like me. But Schooner Dorshaw, thank you for jumping into the chat. I always got real ones riding with me, and I'm always going to keep it 100 out here for the people. But yeah, Megan Thee Stallion needs to dump, jump into the chat and end this right now. Honestly, honestly. Now, people don't want to give Megan praise because, you know, people like to think that female rappers don't uh, write their own bars. People think that the original ghostwriters in hip hop were penning the bars for Little Kim and Foxy Brown and every other female rapper, right? But, but, but let's keep it real. Megan is really outside putting in work. The big three, if we're really going to keep it real, and I'll take Doja Cat out of it. I'll take Doja Cat out. But the big three has to be, has to be Megan Thee Stallion, Drake, and, uh, Who's really outside putting in work? Nas, man, let's keep it a buck. Let's keep it up. Let's keep it absolutely real. Let's keep it absolutely real. The big three right now, the most popular rappers outside, active right now. Nas, Drake, Megan the Stallion. If that that is the true, honest big three. This whole big three that J. Cole, Kendrick, and uh Drake is talking about, that's millennial hip hop. That's, that's who the millennials uh, still listen to and check for and who they have the most memories tied to to the music. But if we're really talking about, if we're really going to talk about who is outside putting in work and who is hella successful, it is not J. Cole. <laughs> it's really not J. J. Cole is only popping right now because he's on tour with Drake and he's involved in all the F, F fuck shit happening right now. He's involved in the funk, right? Other than that, we really got to keep it real. 
got to keep it real. The females are outside dominating hip hop right now. Let's keep it absolutely a buck. But people don't want to say that. People don't want to say that because this is still a male dominated art form. But I want didn't didn't Megan Thee Stallion diss Drake too on the on the on the his song talking about lipo and stuff like that and take shots at Drake. See, Drake didn't respond to that because he don't want smoke with Megan. Megan honestly got nothing to lose. Her mama and daddy are dead. Uh, the whole industry turned on her when she got shot in the foot. I'm sorry I'm caping for Megan right now, but I'm, I'm going to keep it real. Anyway, I'm continuing here. It's even more clever that the clip bleeds perfectly into Nobody Knows My Struggle, where future raps, you thinking I started this shit and then wasn't going to finish. You got to be crazy. This line could be referencing the initial shots that Future and Metro shot on We Don't Trust You, which we're now doubling down on, which they're now doubling down on. So yeah, Future saying, we're going to stand on business. We're standing on business here and we're actually going to fight against you, Drake. We're actually going to go to war in this case. So uh, going out here, even more subtly, the mere inclusion of This Sunday, a near decade old song that Drake used as the reference track for Feel No Ways and was leaked online in 2022, could also be a way of future showing how much he influenced the OVO rapper. Additionally, there were lots of lines on the album where future says things like, you, you fuck my bro behind my back on Beat It. That could be interpreted as allusions to his rumored beef with Drake over a woman, but future has been writing lyrics like that for years. So it's difficult to definitely say it's about him, right? So yeah, like I'm saying, Future, in this case, is throwing a lot of subliminal shots, and he is the weakest link lyrically. Like, it's hard to even understand what Future is saying sometimes, let alone his lyrics have never been the, the most prominent aspect of why we like Future. You get what I'm saying? So the thing about uh, this whole beef with Drake and Future, it's it seems, you know, I really feel bad for Future. But it also seems like Future should stay out of it and let the real lyricists around him handle business and stand on business in this case. So uh, continuing here, continuing here. An appearance from J. Cole again. Wait, did J. Cole jump on the album? Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, this is crazy. This is crazy. Like I said, like I said, I think Drake was taking shots at J. Cole on dropping Give Me 50. When he was talking about, uh, you know, uh, F what Cole is saying, that K dot shit was weak, right? And then he goes on talking about top one to piece it up, top one to piece it up. I, I, this is amazing. I did not know. I have not been checking out. I have not been checking for what J. Cole has been dropping here. Let's go to song Red Leather. So J. Cole makes an appearance on Red Leather, which is an older future track that was leaked on the internet over a year ago. Cole's verse was not on the leak, but despite what the internet might think, it is very unlikely he recorded his portion of the song in the four days uh, since he apologized to Kendrick Lamar. Rap social media accounts were quick to interpret lyrics like, my energy was never on some toughest nigga shit. I was just a conscious rapper who will fuck a nigga bitch. And Blitz gets a blast and I turn into a track star. <laughs> Once again, these rappers talking about sleeping with these other uh, guys, women, and then talking real gangster when we have not known them for that at all is absolutely insane. Blix gets a blast and I turn into a track star as J. Cole's response to his short-lived beef with Kendrick. But these are wild generalizations that don't take into account when the verse was likely recorded. So they're trying to say that they're trying to extrapolate here that J. Cole was taking shots at Kendrick like years ago, the entire time. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So, uh, yeah, I don't I don't get that because Kendrick and J. Cole were cool. They were generally cool. They sort of like left each other alone. Like J. Cole sort of fell into the background. Kendrick takes years off from rap and they sort of let Drake dominate the industry. So I, I don't understand why J. Cole and Kendrick would have beef. I don't think J. Cole was upset that they never dropped their, you know, their collab project. I just think the times uh, went uh, times past them. The times passed them, so now they're just, you know, doing different things. Continuing here, lyrics about how he was never on some toughest nigga shit would have applied to Cole regardless of the recent situation uh, with Kendrick because he's always made allusions to caring more about his peace than anything else. So it's a stretch to call this a response. It is certainly interesting and a little surprising that Cole still cleared the first for the album, knowing the feud that Future, Metro, and Drake are currently in. So it was inevitable that Twitter will blow up when everyone heard his verse on red leather but it's misleading to read too much into the actual lyrics since they were likely recorded before all of this happened now drake is on some 50 cent ish right now drake is really like going in like uh about uh 
you know, whoever is siding with you, he's rapping like 50. You know, like I talked about this in the live stream last night about dropping Give Me 50. Drake is attacking anybody who is associating with Metro, Future, Weekend, anybody like that. So I find this surprising that J. Cole and Drake are on tour together, but J. Cole still gave the green light for this verse to be on the album. Absolutely insane. Doesn't make sense to me. It absolutely does not make sense to me that he would... Uh, you know, do this to his homie, right? Because him and Drake are like this now. But once again, maybe I'm missing something. I'm going to jump into this article here from the Washington Post where they're breaking down everything. Maybe, you know, usually when mainstream media talks about hip hop beef, they just generalize it. And mainstream media doesn't know the ins and outs or nuances of hip hop. But this article was written by a black woman, Janae Kingsbury, shout out to her, writing for the Washington Post on April 12th, 2024. So we're gonna jump into this article and read into it. Maybe she has some new information that can enlighten us because I'm still not getting where all of this is coming from. Like Ross is dissing him because Drake got uh, into a legal issue with French Montana. Uh, the weekend is throwing shots because he's glad he didn't sign to OVO. Uh, you know, Future is not really saying anything much because he's leaned out <laughs> and mumbling on the tracks. But we don't know exactly what the Future and, and Drake beef is really about yet. You know, J. Cole apologized to Kendrick. Kendrick, you know, sort of jumped out of nowhere on like that. Like, we still don't know the ins and outs. And hopefully somebody can explain this to us. I don't know if this will be a documentary like years now, later. Or what will happen, but uh, I'm very interested to see if this article can break this down. So, the Kendrick Lamar, Drake, J. Cole, and ASAP Rocky beef explained. An ongoing face-off between four hip-hop heavyweights plays out on records, on stage, and online. This was written by Janae Kingsbury, published on April 12, 2024, right here. Before I jump into this, I want to say a shout-out to all the white supremacists and Nazis in the chat. So, Stink Garbage and Stink uh, George, all these people here are horrible, deplorable people. But I want to say thank you for supporting a young black man on his YouTube journey. It, the more comments you leave, the more interaction you leave in the chat. Stink George, uh, Purple Pill Composure, uh, uh, Chimp Out, all of you guys are helping the channel grow. So I want to say thank you for helping me on this journey on YouTube, on actually trying to you know, continue to fight against white supremacy, talk about anti-black racism. And I want to say you guys are all welcome to follow me on Twitter, Laji and Riki. We can have a debate. We can have a discussion. I will destroy all of your stupid ideas. You guys can prove how uh, small dicked and neck bearded you are and how your uh, ideas don't have any weight and how you are all losers and how you are all also uh, pussies as well because you refuse to show your face and you have to hide on the internet and hurl insults rather than articulate yourselves in a way. Uh, 4chan has rotted your brains. Uh, uh, the white supremacist movement will always be uh, the place that the uh, lower class white trash whites will congregate. But I want to say thank you once again for uh, continuing to jump into the chat right here. So uh, let's jump into this. So competition is a firm pillar of hip hop. Years before Tupac and Biggie or Jay-Z and Nas ever traded lyrical blows on iconic diss tracks, DJs squared off at legendary block parties, break dancers battled out in competitive ciphers, MCs exchanged fiery bars and battle raps on stage. Those traditions uh, laid the cornerstone for a genre that continues to evolve, propelling hip hop into a global phenomenon and elevating rap artistry. So last month, when beef started to broil between the industry's purported big three, Kendrick Lamar, Drake, and J. Cole, after Lamar took direct aim at Drake and Cole in a guest verse on Like That, a track on the new Future and Metro Boomin album, We Don't Trust You, fans eagerly awaited a rap battle for the ages. A potential face-off between Lamar, Drake, and Cole could be a culmination for three rap heavyweights who have dominated their genre, generating numerous accolades, critical acclaim, and fierce debates among fans engaging in endless discussions of the genre's greatest artists. Mm. See, once again, the mainstream media just does these generalized hip-hop pieces. Like, okay, yeah, hip-hop has always had competition, blah, 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 blah. We already know this. Like, get to the meat and bones. Like, the past couple of weeks have been the most exciting time in hip-hop we've had in a long time, said Soumya uh, Chris... Krishna Murthia, a music journalist and author. It's the first time that we've seen three artists at the top of their game really going after the crown. Okay, it's not really uh, three... <sighs> 
okay, it's really one-sided. It's really one-sided. And this is the thing, once again, about mainstream hip-hop. Soy Maya Krish, Krishna, right? This is obviously an Indian woman writing about hip-hop as an outsider, you know, music journalist and author. I'm pretty sure her books are not about hip-hop or they're not about, you know, the, the genre in depth and stuff like that. So yeah, they're, they're, they're writing from this in a very strange way because it's really just Kendrick you know, going for the crown because Drake's had the crown. Nobody's denying that Drake doesn't have the crown. He's really outside with it. But what followed Lamar's verse hasn't quite been a classic hip hop beat with J. Cole retracting a response and Drake limiting himself to a veiled allusions so far. And now Rihanna's partner, ASAP Rocky, has taken his own shots at Drake. Here's how to make sense of it all. So how did the feud start? How did we all get here? Lamar's verse on Like That references Drake and Cole's 2023 song, First Person Shooter, in which Cole dubbed the three rappers in the industry's greatest. We the big three like we started a league, but right now I feel like Muhammad Ali, Cole rapped. Lamar profanely dismissed the notion, concluding, it's just big me. But he saved most of his venom for Drake, seemingly comparing himself to Prince and Drake to Michael Jackson, noting that Prince outlived Mike Jack and referencing Drake's latest album for all the dogs. Uh, for all your dogs getting buried, that's a K with all these nines. He going to see Pet Cemetery. I thought that was actually hard, but they're not going to explain that bar. But for anybody who doesn't understand that bar, for all your dogs referencing Drake's album, they're all going to get buried, meaning all of Drake's friends are going to get buried, maybe metaphorically or uh, literally. That's a K, an AK. 47 with all these nines, these nine millimeter guns. He gonna see Pet Cemetery. That's a horror movie where a bunch of people died, right? So it's a very, very graphic reference, right? And Kendrick really started, you know, coming out swinging, really talking that gangster talk. Very, once again, obscure and strange for a conscious rapper to be talking this, you know, gun talk. But I don't know where it's coming from, but it's still, it's still a hard line. Nobody's gonna take away that it wasn't a bar. So Lamar drawing a line in the sand, said Rob Markman, a music journalist and vice president of content strategy at Genius, a service that annotates uh, song lyrics. Kendrick is the aggressor here. His stance, so it seems, is you can't just say you're the greatest. You're going to have to prove that. We're not in a world where you can just say anything. This is hip hop. I met Rob Markman one time in Miami. He's a cool guy. He tried to be a rapper a few years ago. It didn't really pop off. But uh, yeah, he's a real hip hop journalist, really deep into the culture. Shout out to Rob Markman. He's the truth. So how did J. Cole respond? Okay, so they're not really talking about how the beef started. They're just saying that Kendrick jumped out of the woodwork. Like I'm saying, this does not make any sense. None of it actually makes sense on what's happening with J. Cole, Drake, Kendrick. What is the real underlying issue? They're talking about is it's strippers or it's women. We need to know what the underlying issue is. Is it about money? Is it about Drake's uh, just being at the top? What is it about? What is it about? Because until then, I'm going to assume it's basically jealousy. Kendrick has always been jealous of Drake. Future is jealous that uh, Drake did the song with uh, Drake did the album with 21 Savage. Uh, J. Cole is just like, I'm out of it. Like, you know, you guys are talking about K's with nines and pet cemeteries. I'm, I, I just want to put an M on your head like Luigi brother. You get what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just insane that this continues to happen. But there's no explanation for what's going on. I hope somebody can really reveal it. So on April 5th, Cole dropped the surprise album, Might Delete Later, including the song Seven Minute Drill, in which the North Carolina native implies that Lamar only averages one good rap verse every 30 months and that he disses other artists in his music for attention. Cole also criticized Lamar's acclaimed albums to Pimp a Butterfly and Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, calling the first boring and overrated and the second tragic. So many listeners viewed that angle as a major misfire. The problem with that verse is Kendrick has a stellar discography, said Markman. The whole thing about battle raps, it doesn't all have to be true. But when you're most successful is when you take a bit of the truth and twist it in your favor and you get the public on your side. I think that's what Cole tried to do here, Markman said. I think it was a swing and a miss. I honestly like Seven Minute Drill, and I don't think that J. Cole was too off bounds, right? He gave damn its prop saying it was his biggest, but that his last was just average, right? Which is what a lot of people have said. 
A lot of people have said Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers was not an album that really hit like Damn did or like Good Kid Mad City did. If, if we keep it real, all of Kendrick's albums have been fantastic and wonderful. But the ones that people play the most are Good Kid Mad City and Damn. But we all recognize the Pimple Butterfly as being one of the greatest rap albums of all time. And that, you know, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers was very brave of him to do a therapeutic album like that. You get what I'm saying? But Continuing here, so Cole seemed to agree. While on stage at his Dreamville Festival in Raleigh, North Carolina on Sunday, the rapper walked back what he said on the track, explaining that the response he saw to the song didn't sit right with my spirit, uh, quote unquote, disrupting his sleep and peace of mind. So that was the lamest, goofiest shit, Cole said. He also told fans that he would update the song or remove it from streaming services. As of this writing, it remains available. J. Cole famously said he let Nas down in a song many years ago, and with this move, he's let hip-hop down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Krishna Murthy. Oh, Krishna Murthy. You really talking. <laughs> oh, Krishna really talking. Uh, J. Cole famously said he let Nas down. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Uh, it's disappointing to see that somebody who, as an athlete himself, understands healthy competition and sportsmanship and also is a true lover of the art form of hip hop will come out with a diss record and then 48, lower, 48 hours later rescind it. Yeah, it doesn't make sense doesn't make sense that he would say that. Yeah, uh, very, you know, J. Cole tried to play basketball in Africa. He went to like Rwanda and joined like the national team and something like that. So yeah, J. Cole understands competition and competition is just healthy. It's natural. It's what makes the world move. It was very disheartening to see that he didn't want to be a part of this hip hop beef. Like he didn't want to be a part of this uh, this uh, competitiveness that was uh, breaking out because it would have been very healthy for hip hop to see this. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but I think it's because you know, Kendrick. I mean, Drake saw. Sorry, J. Cole saw Cole saw that this uh, Cole slaw. <laughs> That's a bar. Anyway, Cole saw that this beef was about to get really nasty, and they were really, really, really about to start talking really gangster. Like that's why. Uh, you know, he maybe dropped out. And also because J. Cole likes to ride his bike and be in like wild places, like how Andre 3000 walking around playing with the flute, J. Cole will like randomly ride his bike in like some small town in America or like through Los Angeles. And I don't think he wanted that beef. Like he didn't want to have to look over his shoulders when he's bicycling through Santa Monica. So that's what I think is happening here. Anyway, continuing. How did Drake respond? Drake has yet to release a song in response to Lamar, but many fans speculate that comments he's made on stage and on social media were directed at the Compton rapper. I got my head up high, my back straight, I'm 10 toes down, Drake told the crowd during a uh, stop on his tour in Sunrise, Florida on March 23rd, there's nobody on this earth that could ever mess with me in my life. Naturally, he uses more profane terms. Come on, mainstream media, you can put the curses in there. We're all adults here. If you're subscribed to the Washington Times, you at least got to be over 18 years old and you've heard the word fuck before. Come on. Anyway, Days later, he shared an Instagram post with the caption, they'd rather go to war with me than admit they are their own worst enemy. Drake is no stranger to rap feuds. Having previously mixed it up with big names like Meek Mill, Pusha T, and Ye, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West. Drake is battle-tested. Drake is very strategic, Markman said. He's not going to just come out with anything. I find this very funny because I think... I think uh, my wife said this last night when we were talking about, you know, Drake's Jewishness caused the whole industry to start embracing Hebrew Israelites. Like after Drake popped off, uh, Kendrick is talking about, I ain't black no more. I'm an Israelite. <laughs> Kanye West talking about he an Israelite too. <laughs> J. Cole is probably on that wave as well. Like, all Drake has to do to really drop the mic on all these people is put on the yarmulke and say, y'all really wish y'all was like me. Y'all wish y'all was like me, huh? Y'all wish y'all was nice like me. Stuff like that. Drake's Jewishness probably gets under a lot of people's skin because they bet I bet they probably think Drake has an unfair advantage, right? Because Kendrick, J. Cole, these guys go into the uh, offices and the meetings and their bosses are all, you know, possibly Jewish people, right? And uh, yeah, then they see Drake having all this success and they probably think, oh, you know, Drake's got the tie-in. 
you know, because he's a part of the uh, the tribe. He's a part of the Hebrew tribe. Uh, so, yeah, I think maybe there also is some jealousy there with that. But that's interesting. This is another interesting part of this battle, right? Uh, so Drake is battle tested. Drake is very strategic. Markman said he's not just going to come out with anything, but he's also been known to play the sidelines. Krishna Murthy said there's quite a few high profile beefs, most notably Pusha T, that we're still watching on that. And we're still waiting on that response. We're not waiting for the Pusha T response, Krishna Murthy. OK, nobody's waiting for Drake to reply to Pusha T years later. That beef is dead. Everybody admits Pusha T won the battle. I think Drake even realized he took the loss, but we still respect Drake because he, because he put his fist up, right? He put his fist up. He fought. He lost. That's okay. He won the battle with Meek. He lost the one with Pusha T. Now he's in this third trial where the whole industry is going at him. What will happen next? All he has to do is fight, and the Drake fans will fight for him. That's it. You know what I mean? And depending on uh, what the beefs, are, what the diss records are, and what he says, I will advocate for Drake too. Right now, I do think dropping "Give Me 50 is a cold diss, and Kendrick is gonna have to come hard to reply, and hopefully it's soon. R Ross's diss was good too, not as mean as Drake's was, but uh, there's still a uh, Ross's diss also wasn't as effective as Drake's was, but there's still more to say. Continuing here, rumors are swirling about when we'll hear from Drake. I have it on good information that both sides went in the booth and came out. Joe Budden, the media personality and former rapper, shared on his podcast Wednesday. And what I'm hearing from both sides is that it's nuclear. Okay. All right. So this obvious this article was obviously written before the uh, dropping Give Me 50 came out. So what did ASAP Rocky say? Alliances may be forming on both sides across hip hop. Lamar's disc came on a record with Metro Boomin, who has beef with Drake in future, a frequent collaborator of Drake's. And some fans suggested that Rick Ross shaded Drake after he posted a video of himself listening to Lamar's verse while smoking a cigar. It's almost like Marvel, Marvel's uh, Captain America Civil War, said Markman, where you got superheroes on one side, superheroes on another side, and it's about to be a clash going on. Friday, another big name joined forces against Drake, ASAP Rocky, who appears on the track Show of Hands on Future and Metro Boomin's second album in three weeks. We still don't trust you. Drake and Rihanna, with whom Rocky have, has two children, once dated, and Rocky's lyrics appear to reference that history. Men and their feelings over women. What you hurt or something, as well as Drake's son. I smashed before you birthed, son. Flacco hit it first, son. Whose existence only came to light during Drake's highly personal 2018 showdown with Pusha T. So what is everyone else saying? Cole's apology speech was met on social media with an explosion of jokes, memes, and hot takes from fans who felt robbed of a huge matchup. Even brands like Spotify have waded into the feud, posting billboards across New York City that read, hip hop is a competitive sport. <laughs> see, see, everybody wants to see the battle. Everybody wants to see the battle. Uh, we just don't want to have the pressure of these guys having to go the extra mile, right? Like nobody wants to see Kendrick hurt. Nobody wants to see Cole hurt. Nobody wants to see Drake hurt. And I'm worried that if the mainstream media gets involved or these or these streaming services get involved, they're going to try to amplify this, right? Because let's keep it real. Dissing in the past, dissing in hip hop has changed. It's no longer just, you know, rhymes against rhymes. Now a lot of people are dying. Like Chicago Drill really changed the scenery of hip hop because now people diss and now people want to spin the block while they diss, right? People actually want to murder other rappers, right? And that's the biggest problem right now in hip hop. That's why I'm somewhat sympathetic to J. Cole dropping out. But I think if we can't have the biggest, most successful rappers have a competition right now and, and, and beef, you know, what is this genre actually becoming? Hip hop might actually die if we can't actually have those things happening here. So fans say Cole's uh, retraction moves against that idea. What happened to hip hop? Many users lamented on X, formerly Twitter. I hope J. Cole is happy knowing the irreversible damage he did to hip hop this past weekend. Another user wrote, some commenters uh, are still hopeful for a response from Drake. During a live stream on Monday, DJ Academic said his exchange with Drake seemed to confirm that the rapper would not take the same route as Cole. Please don't apologize and do weird shit, Academic said as he messaged to Drake. The rapper allegedly responded, I can't believe you will pull up and say some shit like that to me. You must not know me. <laughs> Hilarious. Other voices across the hip-hop world have weighed in. 
So Charlemagne the God, host of the syndicated radio show The Breakfast Club, said he respected Cole's decision to bow out of the feud. The rap fan in me understands the disappointment many of you feel in Cole, he said, but the man in me who understands that I'm a spiritual being living a human existence has nothing but respect for what J. Cole did. So many of us lead with pride and ego nowadays, and we let these idiots on social media who we don't even know peer pressure us to say things and do things that we don't even want to do. Uh, yeah, Charlemagne, I understand where you're coming from, but can we have some toxicity? Hip hop is the only genre where you can still say what you want to say and and rap whatever you want to rap, and nobody's going to cancel you, right? Should we sell? Should we be policing ourselves? I understand that as men, we should grow spiritually, emotionally, uh, um, in all ways as we get older, right? But can we have a little bit of toxicity? What is wrestling? What is football? What is basketball? What is baseball? What is any sport? It's a little bit of toxicity in a world where we have to be more civilized and respectable most of the time, right? Can we have rappers diss each other, battle each other, and not it lead to you know toxicity amongst each other, right? Do we always have to just say, well, guys, I'm on a spiritual, healthful, uh, enlightening journey as a man? Can we have a little bit of beef? Can we? I don't know. Continuing here. Meanwhile, gangster rap mogul Marion Suge Knight, who was serving a 28-year prison sentence for manslaughter, slammed Cole on a recent episode of his podcast, Collect Call. J. Cole, you're supposed to say what you mean and mean what you say, Knight said. To be the best, you got to beat the best. This is a contact sport. And we used to say back in the day, if you don't want to be a gangster rapper, go be, a, go be R&B. West Coast, stand up. It's a victory. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Knight's comments call back to a more vicious era in rap beefs between East Coast and West Coast artists in the mid-90s. The tension centered on the feud between superstar rappers Christopher Wallace, known as Biggie Smalls, who was signed to Puffy's... Uh, Puff Daddy's New York City label Bad Boy Records and Tupac Shakur from Knight's Los Angeles-based label Death Row Records. Uh, songs like Biggie's Who Shot Ya and Shakur's Hit Em Up are classic diss tracks, but that feud famously ended with the killings of both rappers and drive-by shootings within six months of each other. These days, beef doesn't get that far as long as it fuels the art, as long as it stays on record, as long as nobody gets hurt in real life, as long as you don't end up with a Biggie and Pac situation, I think the competition Petition is good for us, Markman said. And I agree with Rob Markman here. And yeah, Suge Knight should not be talking because Beef is what got his partner killed, uh, Tupac, and it's also got him in a jail cell right now. So yeah, this whole situation with the big three, I find highly fascinating. It could be healthy for hip hop, uh, for people to get interested in the art form, because something that needs to be discussed is hip hop's decline right here. We need to be talking about this right here. And this is a major issue. Hip hop don't stop. Uh, or does it? For the first time in 30 years, hip hop hasn't hit number one in the first half of the year. This is from uh, June 13th, 2023. Now, this is a bit old, and I think this is, of course, changed because I believe Doja Cat, like I said earlier, had a hit with number one, went number one with uh, Paint the Town Red and that sort of stuff, right? So, yeah, hip hop does sometimes still make a lot of hit records, right? And there are a, a lot of diehard hip hop fans out there like myself, right? And streaming services live on hip hop. Like I believe Spotify, 40% of their revenue is probably just hip hop based, right? So yeah, these companies need hip hop, but still hip hop might not be as exciting for people and they might not be tuning in as much. And I believe this beef could make people want to tune in and want to discuss hip hop. On my channel, I talk mostly about, you know, politics, society, anti-black racism, white supremacy, and that sort of stuff. But even I am talking about this situation with Drake, Cole, and Kendrick because it is so fascinating. It is so great. It's something that does get you excited about this art form. We've wanted to see these artists collaborate together on one song or have disses against each other, right? So this is the thing. It's all entertainment. These guys know that, you know, they're entertainers at the end of the day, and we want to be entertained. We want blood, right? So Let's go here. So this was published, like I said, on June 13th, 2023 by Music Radar. As it turns 50 in 2023, has hip hop been knocked off the top spot? So hip hop is one of the world's most popular genres, a style of music that's been on the rise since its inception in the 1970s. In fact, back in 2017, hip hop and R&B collectively surpassed rock music as the most popular music genres in the United States, and their dominance on streaming platforms has seemingly uh, held fast ever since.
Uh, this makes it all the more surprising that 2023 is the first year since 1993 that hip hop has yet to yield a number one song or album in the first half of the year. Billboard reports that as we reach 2023's midpoint, not a single hip hop artist has topped the Billboard Hot 100 or the Billboard uh, 200 albums charts, while only six hip hop singles have broken into the top 10. By this point in 2022, however, six different rappers had released number one albums, Gunna, Pusha T, Future, Kendrick Lamar, Lil Durk, Tyler the Creator all hit the top spot in the first half of last year, while Jack Harlow, Future, and Drake topped the Hot 100 with tracks like First Class and Wait For You. So what's behind hip-hop's failure to take the crown in 2023? Is this the beginning of the end for a genre that's been on a decades-long commercial hot streak and celebrates its 50th birthday this year? Before we declare that hip-hop's dead, we should probably note that despite its failure to reach number one, the genre's overall sales have remained strong this year and are actually up by 6.3% compared to the first half of 2022. Like I said, these streaming services make a ton of money on hip-hop, and for me, guys, I don't listen to Drake and Kendrick and J. Cole all the time. I'm listening to a lot of underground rappers like Zero, like Webby, like Boosie, like Mozzie, like Payroll Giovanni. Like that's who I'm listening to, right? And there's a, a ton of people like me who listen to that, who listen to like the Larry Junes and the E40s and stuff like that, or the older catalog like Trick Daddy or or whatever you're into, right? Mob Deep, whatever, right? So a lot of people are streaming music that they actually like, and it might not be the top guys because now the internet has allowed everybody to listen to whatever they want to listen to all the time. So yo, the sales are actually up, but we haven't had a number one song, or at least we didn't have a number one song uh, in 2023 at that part of the year, right? So hip hop is gradually losing its primacy in terms of market share though. R&B and hip hop collectively uh, accounted for 26% of the US market in 2023 so far a figure that's down 1.8% from the same figures in June 2022. Though it's a small dip, it's a telling one, uh, as both country music and Latin music have made significant uh, gains in this year, suggesting that they might be on track to supersede hip-hop and R&B in the years to come. Mm. Anyway, oh, oh, wait, here we go. All right, I thought the article was over. I thought they were just done. I was like, okay, this is really bad journalism. So Billboard speculates that hip-hop's apparent decline could be due to a number of factors. The genre's biggest names have opted not to release albums this year after a strong showing in 2022, while the charts as a whole have remained stagnant thanks to the dominance of a select few releases. Miley Cyrus's uh, Flowers and Morgan Wallen's Last Night have both enjoyed lengthy runs at the top of the Hot 100, nixing anyone else's chance, chances of reaching number one. Is hip-hop on the way out? Frankly, it's too early to tell, but as Latin music, EDM, and country continue to captivate international audiences and generate increasing numbers of sales and streams, something may have to give, and hip-hop artists will be compelled to adapt or fall behind. Interesting. So that's the article from Music Radar. And yeah, I think, you know, with Beyonce doing the country album, with Beyonce doing the country album, with uh, uh, so many artists and rappers like, uh, you know, experimenting with different genres, uh, starting to sing in music, you know, the line between rapper and R&B artists is blurred. You know, hip hop is constantly evolving and hip hop tomorrow will not sound like hip hop today, just the way hip hop today does not sound like the rap music of yesterday, right? So the genre is always evolving and growing and maybe what we define as hip hop will radically change and that's okay. You got to change with the game and this, Art form is youth driven, right? And I think what these guys are doing here, these big three artists here, they do have the opportunity to make sure that the essence of hip hop, right? One of the important essences is that black men have an outlet to battle, to compete in a productive, healthy way, right? I want these guys to piece it up like Nas and Jay-Z at the end. I want these guys to piece it up like 50 Cent and Fat Joe at the end. I want these guys to make millions of dollars, live long, healthy, successful lives for them and their families. That's what everybody is hoping for in hip hop. We want this beef to be healthy and productive. Drake, you know, you're you're walking that fine line talking about people's wives and baby mothers. Rick Ross, you're talking, you're walking a fine line, you know, talking about, you know, children and well, ASAP Rocky, you're walking a fine line talking about, you know, you slept with Drake's baby mother and stuff like that. Ross, you're walking a fine line calling Drake a white boy and call, pulling his black card and stuff like that. 
So listen, this thing can be very dope, but we want it to be somewhat respectful, right? You guys put the gloves on. Don't bare knuckle this thing. We want all of y'all to be successful. And that's really all I got to say about the story. Shout out to Rick Ross for jumping into the fray. Uh, shout out to Complex for writing that dope article. Shout out to the Washington Post for covering it. Want to shout out to all the people in the chat who jumped in. Shout out to, all right, jumping back to the top. Shout out to Stink Garbage. Shout out to uh, Chimping Out. Uh, Schumer Dorshall and shout out to Purple Consciousness as well. Purple Composure, pardon. Anyway, uh, my name is Simon Hill. Thank you for watching this live stream and peace.